today we conclude the two-part interview series featuring our host, Dr. David Weber and Lindsay. Now, Pastor Williams in the book presents his conclusion based on his experience in Alaska as chaplain to the employees of the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline that there is no real energy crisis. It was all created and manipulated by government for the purpose of controlling consumers. Well, this may seem far-fetched, but we invite you to listen today and, of course, get your copy of the extremely important book. The fully documented information will prove valuable to you. The Energy Non-Crisis is available to you for a gift of $12 or more to the Southwest Radio Church upon request. Simply write to the Southwest Radio Church, Post Office Box 1144, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, 73101 or call toll-free to place your order, 1-800-652-1144. We look forward to hearing from you. And of course, you can get the two-part interview on audio cassette for your gift of $6. Again, our address is the Southwest Radio Church, Post Office Box 1144, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, 73101. We'll be repeating that address and the information on the book at the end of today's broadcast, so stay tuned for that. Right now, let's join Dr. David Weber, our host, as he interviews for the second part of the series, Lindsay Williams, author of The Energy Non-Crisis. Radio friends, God is still on the throne, and prayer changes things. We invite you to join us for special dialogue with Chaplain Lindsey Williams of Alaska. Some of the things you will hear on the broadcast today are almost incredible, but I can assure you, Chaplain Williams has served over 10 years in Alaska as missionary and chaplain, and you can read in his book, everything is well documented. I'm talking about his newly updated and enlarged book, the non-energy crisis. This is available for your gift of $10 or more for radio time and upon your request. Three copies for a $25 contribution. The watch toll-free number to call 1-800-652-1144. That's 1-800-652-1144. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, Thank you for the privilege to witness the faithfulness of God, that there is salvation in none other in the name of Jesus. That there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Bless the testimony of our friend and colleague, Pastor Lindsay Williams. Bless those who hear. God give them understanding they will hear aright and will receive Christ as their personal Savior and will know that God is able to keep them when we have committed ourselves unto him. God, hear and answer prayer for Jesus' sake. Amen. Again today, we have the privilege of talking to Chaplain Lindsey Williams, the chaplain of the Alaska Pipeline who has lived in Alaska, I believe, about 14 years. Now, his controversial book of over 200 pages, The Energy Non-Crisis, recently updated and enlarged, is, of course, what we're basically talking about. Brother Williams, would you tell our radio friends about some people in Washington who know what you tell about the energy crisis to be true? Dr. Weber, there are a number of people in Washington, D.C. who have stated that they believe what I say. The first example would be a letter which I have in my hand from a congressman. It's on the official letterhead stationery of the Congress of the United States of America, and he says, Thank you for your letter and a copy of your book. It is not just the North Slope. There is enough oil all around the country to handle our energy needs for many decades. The federal government is the problem. And I've said so on many occasions. Sincerely, Larry McDonald. Now you will relate that to flight 007. That airplane that was flying from Anchorage, Alaska to South Korea. 
747 airplane shot down by the Soviets, Mr. Larry McDonald was aboard. Well, that's very interesting. Of course, we did some information broadcasts after that on the subject of Russian 007. Do you think that uh, the fact that Larry McDonald was aboard that flight had anything to do with it? Well, Larry McDonald's wife made it very plain over nationwide TV that she felt he had been assassinated. And I would be prone to concur with her after articles that I've read uh, in different papers across the country. Such as? Well, there's one in the Sunday Statesman Journal, September the 25th, 1983, from Salem, Oregon, in which it states that there was a former president of the United States of America on flight 007. That former president of the United States of America, so the article states, went only as far as Anchorage, Alaska, was told by the CIA to get off of the airplane and return back to the lower 48 states, which he did, and only Mr. Larry McDonald continued on on the flight, and of course the flight was shot down on its way to South Korea. And the front page of the newspaper states that that former president of the United States of America was none other than former President Nixon. Now, I, at the time, was in Alaska, understand that President Nixon was seen in the Anchorage airport getting off of the airplane and returning back to the lower 48 states. Only Larry McDonald went on, and the airplane was shot down on its way to South Korea. Now, it's also quite significant that the navigational system on that 747 airplane I was with a United Airlines pilot the other day in Northern California, and he said, Lindsay, do you know what kind of navigational system was on that airplane? I said, I understand that it was inertial navigation. He said, that's correct. He said, there were two inertial navigation systems on that airplane. And he said, both systems are programmed independent of each other. He said, inertial navigation is the most sophisticated navigational system known to man today. He said, Lindsay, those systems were programmed 30 minutes prior to flight. There is a central computer that monitors each inertial navigation system and lets the pilot and co-pilot know if the plane was one bit off course. He said, Lindsay, it was totally impossible for that airplane to have been in Russian airspace. Well, I said, that's interesting because I said they went to international waters looking for the little black box. They didn't go to Russian airspace. He said, that's correct because the airplane was never in Russian airspace. He said they went out and intentionally shot it down in order to get Mr. Larry McDonald, who was probably the most hated enemy of the Soviets in Washington, D.C. today. Well, of course, that's a matter of record. And I understand that you have a congressional record in which Congressman Larry McDonald had something to uh, say about uh, the North Slopes and the oil. Yes, in fact, Congressman Larry McDonald was so upset over the energy crisis of the early 70s, 73, 4, and 5, until he was able to document with literally page after page after page, which is in the congressional record and can be obtained from the United States Government Printing Office, a documentation of the fact that there was never a gasoline shortage, there was no energy crisis of any kind whatsoever, that America was tried piece by section by piece with a phony energy crisis that never existed. And I have a copy of that congressional record here in my hand in the studio. And this was read before Congress by none other than Congressman Larry McDonald. And what was the date of that article, Brother Williams? The date of the congressional record is October the 14th, 1978, and it's number 168, part six of the congressional record. I understand that uh, one of our cabinet members who recently resigned, James Watt, under duress, also has a connection to an article that uh, you showed to me in the Wall Street Journal. Yes, in the Wall Street Journal, Monday, March the 15th, 1982, while Mr. Watt was still Secretary of the Interior, it states, and I quote, the United States has never had an energy shortage, Mr. Watt says. And then, of course, Mr. Watt attempted numerous times to open up oil pools on the North Slope of Alaska. And every time he did, there would either be a suit filed against him or some ecology group would file a suit against him. And finally, they had to see to it that Mr. Watt was removed because he was too honest of a man to stay in Washington, D.C. And the truth of the matter was, he told the truth on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, and they could not take it any longer. The bureaucracy saw to it that he got removed by well, you remember this line. Uh, what about your letter from the Department of Interior? 
Well, let me also quote one from Mr. Reagan, who is the President of the United States of America. President Reagan also knows that there was never a gasoline shortage. And I have in my hand a article from the Rocky Mountain News, Denver, Colorado, Wednesday, February the 20th, 1980, when Mr. Reagan was running for the presidency. And it states in the article that Mr. Reagan stated in public before the media numerous times that we have as much crude oil in Alaska as there is in Saudi Arabia. Now, within a matter of a few days' time after President Reagan made this statement, you'll probably remember that so many government agencies came down on him with all of that pressure until he withdrew his statement and apologized and never made the statement again. The truth of the matter was, as Senator Hugh Chance, who writes the foreword to my book, The Energy Non-Crisis, was later able to prove, President Reagan was intentionally misbriefed by certain government agencies and caused to withdraw his statement lest he be embarrassed in the midst of a presidential campaign. In other words, he retracted his statement that uh, there had never been an energy crisis. He retracted his statement saying that there is as much crude oil on the North Slope of Alaska as there is in Saudi Arabia, but he knew the truth and then was intentionally misbriefed by certain government agencies and caused to withdraw his statement. Now, Senator Hugh Chance, in the first chapter of my book, The Energy Non-Crisis, states that he also was intentionally misbriefed by certain government agencies in a top-level federal briefing in the Senate of the state of Colorado. Now, if they are intentionally misbriefing government officials, such as the President of the United States of America, such as state senators, how many other uh, items have they also intentionally misled the American people on? Well, I noticed in your book, Mr. Williams, that there have been press reports to the fact that the Alaskan oil field is drying up. What about that? Yes, I have heard that so many times, and people have sent me articles out of news magazines, newspapers, and on and on, stating that crude oil bay is drying up. It's quite significant. Just a few weeks ago, I was in the state of Alaska and talked with one of the executive personnel from the North Slope and showed them some of the articles that people had handed me as I traveled around the country in relation to this. And this gentleman, he just burst out into laughter. He said, Lindsay, he said, I've never seen such a bunch of camaraderie in all my life. He said, we have plenty of oil up there. Now, the Prudhoe Bay oil pool, that's just one pool of oil only, and it has the capability of supplying 2 million barrels of oil every 24 hours for over 40 years at artesian pressure without ever placing a pump on the field. It's one of the most phenomenal oil pools in the world, apart from some of those in Saudi Arabia. So this oil company official just laughed. He said, I wish the American people know what I know as an executive up on the North Slope. In other words, we don't have to be dependent upon Arab oil. No, sir, we have no energy crisis. We have never had an energy crisis. There is no need to have independence on Arab oil of any kind whatsoever. We could supply from our own soil for our entire nation, and the North Slope of Alaska could give us what we need if only those in power would tell the American people the truth and let us have that oil. In fact, tomorrow morning at the gas pump, gasoline could be less than 50 cents per gallon. That sounds rather startling too, doesn't it? We may get into that at a later time. Could it be that the government of the United States simply is not allowing the refineries to produce this oil? Well, in order to answer that question, let me go to the question you asked previously, and that is about a letter which I have from the Department of Interior. Now, I have in my hand a letter on the official letterhead stationery of the United States Department of Interior. This letter is dated May 7, 1981. Now, that date is very significant, and we'll kind of keep it in our memories because in a moment I will read a portion from the annual report of the Atlantic Richfield Corporation, which is related to this date that will prove something. Now, the signature on this letter is the official signature of the Assistant Secretary of Energy and Minerals of the Department of Interior. And the letter states, I quote from the letter, no large oil fields have been found in northern Alaska since the Prudhoe Bay discovery. Now, let me take two expressions in that sentence and clarify where they are geographically. Number one, no large oil fields have been found in northern Alaska. Northern Alaska is a vast area. It extends over 1,500 miles east and west, 130 to 160 miles deep from the Brooks Mountains to the Arctic Ocean. 
that's often referred to as North Slope. The second expression, no large oil fields have been found in northern Alaska since the Prudhoe Bay discovery. Now, the Prudhoe Bay oil field is the one I referred to a moment ago that can supply that two million barrels of oil for over 40 years. Now, in order to prove that that statement is an intentional misrepresentation of the truth, I'm going to allow the listening audience to determine for themselves whether what the Department of Interior, Assistant Secretary of Energy and Minerals, says is true or not, and I have in my hand the annual report of the Atlantic Richfield Corporation dated 1981. Now, this was sent out to every stockholder of Atlantic Richfield Corporation. It's not private knowledge. It's for everyone to see. And I read from an article, quote, Kaparic River Field. Now, remember, the Department of Interior said no large oil fields have been found in northern Alaska since the Prudhoe Bay discovery. And Atlantic Richfield's report is talking about the Kaparic River Field. Now, the Kaparic River Field and the Prudhoe Bay Field are adjacent to each other on the North Slope of Alaska, different oil pools side by side. I continue in Atlantic Richfield's annual report. Quote, oil production from the 20-square-mile initial development area of the Kaparic